Okay, so good afternoon everybody. My name is Josh Lim. I am a student at the Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines. I actually just graduated last March, so now officially I am unemployed. <laughs> I'm serious, I am looking for work, so if you have job opportunities for me, feel free to give them to me if you're hiring people in the social sciences. Um, I'm also the secretary of Wikimedia Philippines, which is the Philippine local affiliate of the Wikimedia Foundation. And I will be presenting to you today the promise of collaborative magic, exploring and sharing ideas on constructive collaboration across different open source communities. So you might be wondering why I have to take the picture. Well, here's the backstory as to how this presentation came to be. I'm actually very fortunate to be here today at Open Source Bridge. And I will be thanking all of my sponsors in just 30 seconds or so. But basically, the reason why I'm here, you know, despite all the odds, is because unlike the other Wikimedia representatives who are here today at this conference, I am not funded by the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I was denied funding by the Wikimedia Foundation for my presentation here today. So I resorted to good old crowdfunding. So please allow me to thank all of my sponsors contributed to my campaign. Yeah, everybody, I, if I mispronounce your surname, I'm sorry. Especially for those who are not maybe just family members. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank my aunt, Maria Lourdes Fanlo. Without her generous donation of airline miles, I will not be here today. Um, I'd also like to thank my mom, Catherine Drake, for her donation, as well as some of my aunts and uncles, Barry and Joanna Lo. Hi, Vic and Denise Slim, Evelyn Do, my grandmother, Victoria Lao Lim, and my great aunt, Venda Lao Chua, as well as some of my other sponsors. Mozilla for sponsoring my room. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lucas. Um, VM Russer, without Vicky, I would not be here. She suggested that I should do this. So I'm quite happy that I actually did this. Maria Lukasiewicz, um, Joe Palin, Kathy Reed, Eduardo Villamodongo. Randall Kaw, Nick Patch, and Jesse Jirio Davis, Paula Barazon, Clarice Illustre, Amy Farrell, and Ian Burrell. Please, I hope I pronounced that correctly. And yours just came in 30 minutes ago. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and all those who tirelessly shared, like, helped spread the word and donated, especially if you've been following me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Thank you very much, all of you. And I promise I will try my best to make this worthwhile. Hence the picture. I have to prove to the Wikimedia Foundation I have an audience. That's the reason why they didn't extend the funding. But you know, that's beyond the point. So now the question is, why this presentation? And why, in fact, should we talk about constructive collaboration? Especially coming from a very interesting keynote that they had this morning. As I was telling some of the people here today, basically this presentation is the keynote but in reverse. First of all, I began editing. Wiki uh, I first began editing Wikipedia in 2005. I actually found Wikipedia in the United States. It was still living in Pittsburgh at the time, and you know it's this wonderful project. Everybody wants to share and contribute to all of these things, and you know it just feels so uh, liberating to give you know to give back to people what you already know. And I've been at it for the last nine years, going on 10 next year, and I haven't stopped ever since. However, there is something that we have to realize here. Yes, I am a Wikipedia editor, but I'm not just some Wikipedia editor. I'm actually from this place. I am not a typical Wikipedia. A typical Wikipedia is typically described as what? White, highly educated, male, and from a wealthy Western country, of which I'm actually neither. Obviously, I'm not white. Obviously, I am, well, okay, probably. I am not from a wealthy Western country. I'm from this country over here. The Philippines is an island nation of 7,107 islands in the middle of Southeast Asia. Imelda Marcos famously remarked, we are on the wrong side of Southeast Asia. That's why everybody knows Southeast Asia except us. Um, and yes, we are actually a pretty poor country. Um, I've been more fortunate than others to actually come here. But yes, in general, we're a poor country. We have all the problems that poor countries have. But I am highly educated, and I am male. So that's the only thing that, you know, stands me apart from the typical Wikipedia, or that, you know, makes me in line with the typical Wikipedia. I'm highly educated and male. But that's beyond the point. The point is, I bring in a different perspective on how 
um, we approach the issue of contributing on Wikipedia. Typically, I contribute to Philippine-related articles. Typically, I contribute to you know very mundane things. I've been recently writing about squares and roundabouts and roads. You know, pretty mundane things. Beforehand, it was train stations, banks, uh, airports, etc., etc., etc. But yes, I bring in a typically Filipino viewpoint to Wikipedia, which is traditionally dominated by, you know, white Western points of view. Because obviously a project like Wikipedia reflects the demographic of its contributor of its contributor base, which just happens to be mostly white and male. So what happened was basically this. The start of the year, yes, as in three weeks into the new year, I was greeted with all of these nominations for deletion all involving articles of banks in the Philippines that they have written over the last five to six years. Now, we do evolve as Wikipedians. I have, you know, I have changed my writing style quite a bit. Um, I will get on to why these articles are actually quite problematic in a little bit. But basically, you know, for typical non-Filipino audiences, you would have no idea what these articles are. Which, you know, at the back of my mind, sort of seemed, okay, why were these articles nominated for deletion in the first place, if they were notable, if I knew that they were notable. And in fact, for one of the banks here, it's actually the seventh largest bank in the Philippines. So that should say something about an article being notable. For the most part, though, all the articles were kept after undergoing the articles for deletion process. But as the process was moving along, some quotable quotes came about, which, you know, to my, um, to me, reflected what exactly is wrong with the editing culture as we know it today. First, you know, the comments are pretty innocuous. Okay, um, on the nomination for a small development bank in the central Philippines, the nominator says, and I'll keep him anonymous, but you can find him on Wikipedia if you try. So how are people supposed to believe that the bank actually is notable if nobody has added any references supporting that claim? I will admit, that yes, when I was writing these articles, I was remiss in adding, um, in adding sources. This was from a time when I was still, you know, pretty new to contrib um, contributing to Wikipedia. This was still a time when, you know, we were quite lax about sourcing. So it doesn't really matter if you have to add a reference right then and there. You can just add it on and someone else will find the reference for you later on. But apparently, it became more apparent that that is no longer the case. Then, it started questioning my credibility. Or, or, and this is just me thinking out loud, you could have just created a properly sourced article four years ago. This was on the Postal Savings Bank in the Philippines. And this was 2010 that I actually started writing this article. At that time, um, I was still in college. Um, I figured that you know, it was better for me to move on to greater things, so I was contributing more content. But you know, it seemed a little, off-putting. Yes, you know, I was remiss in adding sources. You're the one who nominated it for deletion. It is your responsibility to look for sources. Why not add them yourself? And then it became quite egregious. And, of course, that's the reason why we have this presentation. Oh, so that's how this is supposed to work? You create a poorly sourced article and others are just supposed to come in and fix it later for you? If, if you remember the keynote this morning, <laughs> what is you know what is open source? Open source is you're supposed to you, you know you give something for people to share. You're supposed to build upon it, and eventually you have a finished product as a course of um, constructive collaboration. Something that I will discuss later on. At first, however, as I started conceptualizing this presentation, you know what I was thinking this. Are you telling me these articles are not worthy of being included in Wikipedia? Yes, that is my graduation photo. <laughs> yes. So, are you telling me my articles are not wiki enough? Come on. Right? So, I will admit that not everyone will be able to handle the situation as well as I could. And I will admit I did not handle it very well. I was actually quite combative with the nominator with respect to why these articles should be kept in the first place. I was quite combative with him as to, you know, his motive for nominating these articles out of the blue, 
because it seemed that he did not do his research and did not dig through the references, basically did a simple Google search. Ah, oh, there's something notable here, delete. That's what it seemed to me. And the question here is, it may happen to me, and I will handle it well. I've been doing this for the last nine years. But what if you're a new editor? What if you've just started out, and then this happens to you? What do you think will happen? So we have the question of what exactly is it that is wrong with the community that allows for this type of behavior to proliferate? So I was discussing with a friend of mine, and he came up with a term that we'd like to happily call wiki magic or collaborative magic in the case of the broader open source movement. So the question now is, what exactly is Wikimagic? Well, first of all, on Wikipedia, there is a basic tenet that everybody must adhere to. It's called being bold in updating pages. Yes, on Wikipedia, you are encouraged to be bold. You are supposed to do these things. Boldness, in fact, is an important aspect of Wikipedia's collaborative culture. And in fact, we sell Wikipedia on this promise, among others. We sell Wikipedia to new editors, to people who have never edited in their lifetimes, you know, before we introduce it to them, that on Wikipedia, you can give whatever you know, and other people will help you along the way. You don't have to know the rules outright. You don't have to know how to format an article right then and there. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that right then and there. You're a newbie. As a newbie, it is expected of you that you will make mistakes. And as a newbie, it is expected of you that you will not do things right the first time. Because on Wikipedia, we sell you on this model. The fact that we are a stigmatic community. In fact, in Andrew Lee's book, The Wikipedia Revolution, a very good book if you want to know more about Wikipedia's history, he defines stigmergy as a phenomenon coined by Pierre Paul Grass to describe how wasps and termites collectively build complex structures. As Istvan Karvai writes, it describes a situation in which the product of previous work, rather than direct communication upon builders, induces and directs how the wasps perform additional behavior. So in this case, we basically say, well, on Wikipedia, we do not tell you what to do. You are supposed to be motivated enough to know what you want to do, and then other people will just follow along. Other people will find the work that you've done if they're reasonably interested in that work, and then they will build up upon it. So you know, for example, you write something on a place you're important. This is my second time in this city, and I'm not as knowledgeable as the rest of the world, you know, or even the people here who live in the city. Let's say you start to write an article on some building here. Naturally, I'm not from Portland, but Portlanders who see the article will be able to build up upon that particular article until you know it's worthy to be called a Wikipedia article or an encyclopedia article for that matter. There is a belief that it is okay to not finish work immediately on Wikipedia. And then you can come back to it later, others will complete it for you. It's completely normal. Because, obviously, the efforts of one person will not be able to make an encyclopedia go from this. This is the Tagalog Wikipedia's homepage in January of 2004. The project was just founded a month ago. And, you know, it basically looked like this. You'll see that there are only two articles. To something like this. This is the Tagalog Wikipedia today. 60,000 articles with a nice main page. This is not the effort of one person. And this will never be the effort of one person. This will always be the effort of a collective because you cannot reasonably expect just one person to do everything. One person is not going to be knowledgeable enough about everything to be able to create such a compendium of knowledge. He'll only know so much. And so the expectation there is like a honeypot. Wikipedia will attract more editors um, and over time, people will give what they know. As Larry Sanger said early on in the history of Wikipedia, wikis don't work if people are not bold. You've got to get out there and make those changes, correct that grammar, add those facts, make the language precise, etc., etc. It's okay. It's what everyone expects. And the emphasis here is mine. Because in the early days of Wikipedia, it was expected that you're not supposed to, um, you know, you're not supposed to get things right. 
You're supposed to just work on it, and other people will correct your mistakes as you go along. Sure, I may make a spelling mistake, it's okay for someone else to correct my work. I may not, I may not have correct references to an article, someone else will have the references for me. Because that's what the community expects. It expects of you to build upon this collective project because it is a collective project. The fact that you're all there to build something should expect that everybody should be out there to build something and not really complain about it. In fact, Larry Sanger continues saying, so you should never ask why, are these why aren't these pages copy edited? Amazingly, it all works out. It does require some amount of politeness, but it works, you'll see. So um, you're not supposed to expect the finished product from the get-go. You're supposed, you know, you will see a product and if there's something wrong with it, eventually you'll be able, you know, you'll see the mistakes. If you see the mistake, feel free to correct it, feel free to jump in. That's exactly what being bold is. You're supposed to jump in because Wikipedia, Wikipedia's model allows you to do that. All right. So, you know, what is the general expectation of us being Wikipedians? Yes, these are um, anime personifications of the Wikipedia project. They are quite cute. So yeah, the expectation is we're all supposed to be friends on Wikipedia. That's why we assume good faith. That's why if someone corrects your work, you don't complain that someone is correcting your work. You simply just you know, assume that that person does well, that person means well, and that person you know, knows what he is doing because it's for the best of the project. Um, of course, however, sometimes we do tend to go a little overboard and we do bite people who do things differently. We do bite newcomers. We are not perfect. We are human. We don't. Um, we will not always welcome everybody with open arms. Of course. But the question is why? As the internet spreads and becomes part and parcel of our personal lives, it is inevitable that it becomes more representative of the collective human condition. We used to think that the internet, right, in its early days, was this great utopian project where you could escape. The real world, and, you know, just be in the virtual world where everything, you know, everybody can get together and sing kumbaya. Unfortunately, now that the internet has proliferated all of our lives, the fact that we're, you know, I'm on Facebook 24 7, um, when I wasn't five years ago, should actually say something. That it became increasingly reflective of the fact that my life is entwined with the internet, and conversely, uh, not, uh, and, you know, as, because of that, my, um, the problems that come with it also get transposed to the internet. So the fact that we can't get along now should actually ask, um, should actually be a question of why we can't get along. And so what I realized coming from this experience was there was a failure of that very collaborative ethos that is expected of Wikipedians. Apparently people are not sharing, people are not contributing, people are not being constructive in the way that they make suggestions. So, that leads me to the second part of this presentation on the failure of Wikimagic. So the question now is why, or how, for that matter, did Wikimagic fail? This also was coupled with another event earlier this year. I'm currently working on the feature article review for the Metro system in Manila. And what I've realized, what I've noticed was this. It was nominated for review. People, you know, were giving a lot of comments, pretty constructive, but nobody was working on it. The people who were complaining about it were not working on it. To the point that this was made. You can make improvements, and this person is actually telling me, you know, to make the improvements. You can make improvements, but it will likely get the listed as a feature article since there is so much work to be done. It will take a lot for it to be a featured article once more. So there is the expectation that I'm really supposed to do all this work. I actually reported to this guy and I told him, you know it would be nice if some of you would actually also help me out with improving this article rather than just complain about how bad the article is. Because this is Wikipedia, right? If, it's, if there's something bad, you're supposed to help make it better. Because there's an edit button over there. The edit button is supposed to entice you to make things better. So basically, when we encourage people to be bold, in updating these pages, it seems that the boldest factor is now gone. 
and people are no longer as bold, you know, as they used to be. People now apparently refuse to step out of their comfort zones and contribute to pages which you're not familiar with. So the question there is, what happened? Um, my background is in um, online communities. Wikipedia is the nexus of my work. And in 2000, um, last year, just a few months after Open Source Bridge, I presented a presentation at Wikimania in Hong Kong entitled The, Wikipe um, the Wikipedia Condition. And I basically argue that Wikipedia today is heavily apartmentalized. So yes, we're actually quite divided. You will have people who focus on wiki projects, people who are active in off wiki activities, people who are, um, you know, people who are active on the mailing lists, people who are active on the notice boards, and then that gets compartmentalized even further. So yes, for example, um, there are Wikipedians from the Philippines, there are Wikipedians who love writing articles about video games, there are female Wikipedians, there are LGBT Wikipedians, there are um, Wikipedians from Portland, Oregon, um, and so on and so forth. So what used to be a single collective identity has since you know, been compartmentalized into various, um, into various identities all under the banner of Wikipedia. So it became, um, why? It became inevitable that Wikipedians had to retreat to their comfort zones as the project grew and the environment around them began to change. Remember that Wikipedia was growing ever larger, and it would be impossible for a small community of people to be able to manage everything all in one go. So you will naturally have people specializing in particular articles from time to time. At the same time, however, it also became inevitable that the community had to self-atomize to maintain the encyclopedia's quality. To quote Jody Dean, people began isolating themselves quote, within bubbles of opinion with which they already agreed, end quote. So as the project grew larger, um, people eventually had to focus more on things in order, you know, especially with this um, need to maintain quality on Wikipedia. So people eventually began to focus on a subset of articles, whereas before they usually just do everything. And the consequence of that is you would not want to edit articles that are not your own. And this is actually both psychological and, well, you know, it's a psychological thing. And it also happens in real life. You have people complaining that wiki projects tend to standardize everything, even when standardization doesn't work. And, you know, since standardization doesn't work, you would not want to edit these articles because then, you know, your work would just be erased over by people who are more focused on the topic area. So at first, he basically said, no, do not cross that line. This is, my, this is your side of the fence. This is my side of the fence. And if you try to cross that side of the fence, you basically say, what well, part of no trespassing did you not understand, right? So as a consequence of that, we became strangers to each other, even if we essentially live in the same house and we don't trust each other anymore. Because we, you know, we're only familiar now with small circles of people. We're not very familiar with Wikipedians other than those that are immediately, you know, outside us. For example, I will admit I'm mostly familiar and I'm, mo and I'm closest to Filipino Wikipedians. Because they're the Wikipedians that I interact with on a regular basis. Despite the fact that I do know a good number of people from outside the Philippines are very good people, despite the fact that I contribute to a number of other topic areas, on Wikipedia. There are actually two reasons for this. The first reason was because of this man. This is John Siegenthaler. In 2005, he complained to the media that Wikipedia defamed him because the, somebody wrote that he, was, that he is responsible for the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Obviously, it wasn't true, but it took a very big hit on Wikipedia's credibility. And so people, um, as an emphasis on quality, the policies began to change. People began to tighten their interpretation of policy in order to make sure that this type of um, event does not happen again. That's the reason why now you have a biographies of living persons policy wherein you really have to be careful in writing about living persons in order not to defame them. The second reason, however, was because of this guy. This is Ryan Jordan. In 2007, he was exposed as the man behind the account called SJ. He was apparently responsible for renaming me in 2006. But basically, it was because of him impersonating a professor, at a, ten, you know, a tenured professor of theology at a private college in the United States, supposedly with a double doctorate, 
that people began to lose trust in one another, that people basically you know, started questioning, are you really who you are? What kind of guarantee do I have that you are not a fraud? To quote Andrew Lee once again, people just had to shake their heads when the SJ scandal broke out and after the damage had been done. There were no good lessons to take away, just disappointment and regret that perhaps assumed good faith was the biggest casualty. It was because of these two events that Wikipedia began changing, you know, in my opinion, for the worse. It began changing in ways that people would not be able to comprehend in the era before 2007. Right around this time, actually, Wikipedia experienced some of the greatest increases that it had, not only in the number of contributors, but also in the number of contributions in general. As this graph will show, the number, the number peaked around sometime after January of 2007 with about 50 plus thousand contributors at one point, and then it started going down. Um, and there are a myriad number of reasons for this, um, which I will explain later on. But it's also, but it's not only the fact that the number of people contributing went down, it's the fact that the community itself was also suffering from burnout. Whoops. So this is a graph that was produced by the Wikimedia Foundation Strategic Planning, um, um, what do you call this? Yeah, the Strategic Planning Committee or what um, And this graph came about. So they say that after around 240 days, after your first contribution, the likelihood of you contributing even further goes down the longer you stay in the community. So the question there is, why? The Wikimedia Foundation conducted several interviews over the course of the strategic planning process. And so according to their site and some of the interviews that they gathered, other interviews suggested that the projects are becoming increasingly hostile and that contributors are relying on policies to revert and delete others' work. So what happened here is basically people started questioning your motives, people started thinking that, you know, you're no good, go away, we know what we are doing. Which obviously is not good for any open source community, where we're supposed to be welcoming people with open arms into these communities, where we're supposed to teach them and nurture them to be the good open source citizens that we want them to be. So the question there is now, how do we reclaim Wikimagic? And why am I here, basically? I'm here because I want to gather input from other open source communities as to why, um, as to how, as to why, you know, we're undergoing this, as to how we can address it, and what kind of lessons can we learn from other open source communities to bring back to Wikipedia so that, you know, if your lessons work well for you guys, maybe it might work well for us as well. So, you know, basically we have, we need the stage an intervention. And I'll be posing to you three different questions. Before I do, let's try to understand the context of these questions. We want to make sure that in any open source community, you want to feel welcomed by the community that you're going to join. You don't want to feel, you know, once you're bitten, the question there is what happens? In Southeast Asia, and even in East Asia, in areas where there is a strong element of shame to the culture, if you've been bitten once, you may never want to come back. And that is the greatest threat of all to the survival of any open source community. If you scare off, if you scare off enough people to the point that they will never want to come back, then the, um, the longevity of your community is put into question. We need to make sure that people are not scared to contribute to these projects that people are not going to feel as if there's somebody looking over their shoulder, and that there's somebody that's out there to get them, because if somebody's out there to get them, what's the point, right? So I pose three questions to the audience today, which I hope we'll be able to talk about. The first question is, how do other open source communities deal with the idea of collaborative magic? How do you deal with the idea of somebody starting something and others building upon what the other person started until it reaches completion. The second question is, how do other open source communities manage project growth 
to control um, to control bureaucratization. Because an element in this, in fact, is the growing bureaucratization of Wikipedia. Yes, there are a lot. Um, the gauntlet for becoming an administrator has increased significantly. It used to be just ask, they'll give it to you. Now you really have, you know, now they really scrutinize your edit history. It came to a point where a prominent Wikipedia editor and a professor at the university in Poland, his name is Dario Sierra, wrote a column in Slate magazine saying, you know, the unbearable bureaucracy of Wikipedia. So, you know, Wikipedia now is increasingly legalistic. There is a policy that says ignore all rules. So, you know, the policy basically is it's a one line policy. If a policy or a guideline prevents you from improving Wikipedia, ignore it. But apparently, the interpretations of the policy are significantly long, are much longer than the actual policy itself. So, imagine that the policy itself is this thick. The interpretation of the policy is this thick, right? There, um, there are in fact about 150,000 pages worth of policy on Wikipedia, so you know the bureaucracy is quite elephantine, and people in fact question the need for that type of bureaucracy, you know, if it serves to scare people off. The third question that I'd like to pose is this. You know, it's a pretty simple question. Is it possible for all of us to just get along? You know, I don't have to fight you. I really don't want to fight this person. I really don't want to fight this person and, you know, have bad blood with you because I know that we mean well. I have assumed good faith, why can't you assume good faith for me? And if not, what should we do to get along? These are the questions that I hope that we'll be able to ponder during the course of this session, which I really hope that, you know, the input of other open source communities will be greatly appreciated. So that ends my presentation. Thank you very much. Let's continue this conversation. Yes, my emails are on there. The first email is for Wikipedia related inquiries. The second email is in the event that any of you want to extend me a job at some point in the future. It's my Twitter handle and my Wikipedia username. And again, I still accept donations for my fundraising campaign, so if you want to contribute, please go ahead. Thank you, and maraming salamat po. Yes? Uh, just a question about some content in the presentation. So you said there were two big events that kind of changed the way that and one had to do with the JFK assassination. And what, could you explain the second one? The second one basically um, was this. The, um, in 2004, I think, there was a, an omnibus an account created under the name S, um, under the name SJ, E-S-S-G-A-Y, J-A-Y. And he eventually rose through the ranks. He was a very prominent Wikipedian around 2006, 2007, um, around 2005, 2006. He was an all-around um, administrator, he was a bureaucrat, he um, basically was, he supposedly promoted the use of Wikipedia in the classroom. On his Wikipedia page, he stated that while my students are taking their exams, I edit Wikipedia and I encourage other academics to do the same. In 2007, he was interviewed by The New Yorker, and he basically said what he normally said, under the guise of being anonymous, and then what happened was he was hired, by Wikia, which is the commercial um, biz which is the commercial wiki business started by Jimmy Wales um, to host commercial wikis, which are of course outside the purview of the Wikimedia Foundation. When he was hired, he had to come clean, he admitted, nope, my name is Ryan Jordan, I'm 24, I have no qualifications, I have a college dropout, I am not who you think I am. The community went into a fervor, and you know, at first Jimmy Wales actually defended him. And then when the public tide turned, um, he eventually um, went against him as well. So what happened was, it basically put into question, how many more Wikipedians are there that impersonate other people? That claim to have these qualifications, but in fact they don't. So that was the big question that came out of it. Because everybody assumed SJ was a good guy before this controversy came about. After that, you, can't really, you don't really know anymore who's the person behind the mask. So then the question is, if you are, if you know, if you hide behind a pseudonym, it usually means you're a bad guy. And that, um, which is very different from before. We understand if you need to use a pseudonym. But uh, we understand if you need to hide your face. But now it's as if, if you hide your face, it means you're hiding something. Okay? 
Any other questions, comments, concerns? As we discussed the three questions, yes. So I think I've been talking through all this with uh, Wikimedia. Um, how are you still, I mean, did it kind of make you question um, how you felt about continuing to contribute? Well, let's put it like this. I would not last long if I did not have an undying commitment to Wikipedia. I wrote in my GoFundMe campaign, if you've seen it, that it is my life's work to empower the developing world through Wikipedia, and I will not stop at that. So even if all these problems, I will still stick with the project to the end, but I do reserve a right to complain if things go awry. We, um, it's insane, so apparently gone awry. Let's see what we can do to fix it. Yes, Sashi. So this is more of a comment, less of a question for now. Um, it seems that one of the driving forces of your caring about Wikipedia is that it's available online and your work is visible to so many people. Mm -hmm. um, and for a big open source project, the one I'm most familiar with personally is Debian, where I'm a developer. Mm -hmm. Debian has a lot of users also, not as many as Wikipedia has readers, but there's a lot of, there's about a thousand to two thousand, depending on how you count, active Debian volunteers. And um, one of the things that you're experiencing in that massive, like, articles revolution thing on the user page that you showed us, or these were talking, yeah. um, is that other people who care about Wikipedia don't want low quality articles to be seen by other people, mm -hmm. who, for whom this might be their first introduction to Wikipedia. And in Debian, we have similar problems where new people uh, get packages to Debian, but then the packages aren't very well maintained, they fail in some technical ways or some copyright related ways. What we generally do is we prevent those from going into the release. Mm -hmm. And in Debian, we have this mindset, which actually is probably outdated and we should probably ditch it, but we have this mindset that people only really look at Debian every two years or so when we do a release. So we have two years to fix it up. Uh, I'm wondering if you think having some kind of release process would improve this, for one thing? There is a release process on a couple of Wikipedias. I'm a Polish Wikipedia contributor where this process exists. It's called planned revisions. So what happens there is if you um, do not have a particular user right, on the Polish Wikipedia is called the redactor, which literally means editor. Um, your edits have to be flagged by an administrator or someone with that flag before it goes live. This actually began on the German Wikipedia. On the English Wikipedia, it was defeated because it would, um, the belief was, if I remember correctly, it would inhibit new people from seeing their work. Obviously because, right, if you post something, immediately and you immediately get to see it and 400 million people get to see it every month you feel good about yourself so you don't want to have your um, your edits held up by somebody who has to review everything before it goes live so it may, um, for the German and the Polish Wikipedias I know it works because they have very small tight-knit communities um, they have smaller rather smaller more tight-knit communities where authority is actually quite established for example, on the German Wikipedia, administrators are actually quite revered in the community, and people actually listen to them. On the English Wikipedia, it tends to be more unruly, so I'm not sure if some if um, a release process will work on the English Wikipedia, but it is something that we have pondered on, and you know, if it does good, why not? Yes, uh, So something I'm thinking about in terms of the questions you asked at the end, uh, one of them is like, uh, they're avoiding bureaucracies. Um, yeah. With our Mozilla Reps program, which is a really great way to have community volunteers be structured and also um, localized, mm -hmm. uh, we do limit how many reps there are in each geographical area mm -hmm. so as to um, kind of really know, so people don't know each other. But I think to avoid the bureaucracy, um, the, the council of the reps is rotated every six months mm -hmm. by vote. So active reps are eligible for that, and, or sorry, active. Members. I'm not even sure the details, but the idea is you switch out the people in power every six months so that your your processes don't get stale and you do have people kind of going, well, why do we do it this way? And certain things stay the same, policies stay small because people are coming in and just trying to be able to maintain the implementation of them. And I do wonder, like, what would it look like if you took, if you're saying these people in, in Germany maybe are sitting very high and highly regarded, but what would it look like, not to say that that's not valuable, but to rotate people through and say, like, right now, you should be the highest high person. Like you should sit back and let other people lead for a bit, and that way you're sharing and growing people's leaderships within the company organization too. Mm -hmm. Just have a question for that. How are the limits determined? Just a curious question. The limits? Yes. You said that um, you have a number of reps per country. How is it determined? I don't. I don't know if there's a formula for it. Mm -hmm. 
I really don't. Like, because it would depend on the area. Like, a lot of times there's different parts of India where there might be like a lot of people in one area, and then like we get one person in Antarctica, right? Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, there's a person in Antarctica who's like, I would like to be a rep, and it's like, but there's nobody there to rep to, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I understand you're excited, but Mozilla, there's other ways to contribute, you know? So it's, it's more about like it making sure it's a good fit, um, and not, not everyone's just like, the only way to be recognized in the project is to be a rep. Kind of like maybe within the queue, the only way to be recognized is to be an editor or something, so you have more status. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, there's just one quote you had there before, you wrote down. Don't isolate yourself within bubbles of opinion with which you already agree. That, yes. That struck a note. Uh, the book I read a while ago, The Big Sort, mm -hmm. and given a choice or given the opportunity, people will move to, physically move to places where they can work, shop, worship, whatever, with people kind of just like them. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure there's a way to prevent that. But we do, I think, I guess I'm agreeing, we do lose something about that. For lack of a better term, diversity. And it seems to me like in an agile team, if you're funding it, you put it together and you have a tester and a dev and a designer, etc. And you kind of force that diversity by having a cross function team. So I, but I don't know how that applies to, to your space. I am, as far as I know, um, it used to be that, and this is even before I was a Wikipedia, because I started. Um, about four years in after the project was founded. The, um, used to be people worked on anything and everything. Um, then what happened was over time, yes, you know, as people grew, as the community grew, naturally you congregate towards those very, um, those very spaces in which, you know, if you see someone who's interested in writing a science article, naturally you'd want to work with that person because you contribute to the same thing. Um, as far as I know, there are spaces which are neutral regardless of affiliation. One of them is called the Tea House. Um, it's a space for new editors where they can come in without fear of being bitten by, um, by more established editors. And there, you know, people can just generally ask questions about what they do, etc., etc. Um, they can contribute any way that they see fit. But as to actually rotate, um, that type of responsibility, that is something I think that we could see at some point if it could apply. I'm not sure how it would apply this time, but um, at the moment, that I can't conceptualize how exactly, but perhaps it might work. Yes? Um, appreciate your, your fervor and, and, and drive. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I have no, I, I think of when projects get so large, it is very, very difficult to uh, maintain that advantage. Um, only observation uh, that I have, and, I, and again, I don't have any idea about uh, the Philippines articles and that sort of thing mm -hmm. in particular, but Wikipedia as a whole, um, in, in terms of just the result, mm -hmm. um, is incredible. As far as I'm concerned, I know that people have you know, uh, mm -hmm. different opinions about that, but so at least, so that's something valuable. I will agree that it is incredible. Um, we would not get to where we are today if it wasn't for all the changes that have happened over the last 13 years. But then there, that, quest, that poses a question in its own right. Is it necessarily right for us to sacrifice um, our community values for the sake of polity? Right? That, that was an important question that was raised throughout this entire discussion. Is it important for us to you know, basically de um, dehumanize, excuse me, the community, so to speak, for the sake of maintaining quality, that we should strive to serve, you know, the common good by writing articles, rather than build a very community that writes those articles to begin with. You know, it's like you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Any, any other guess? Uh, well, I see a lot of the complaints that people propose to you uh, revolve around uh, equality and. Mm -hmm. Correctness of, of, of the articles. I wonder if there's something that I, can, I, I know that there was a project that was started to try to like highlight recent changes. So yeah. that, you know the changes, some change would be in there immediately, but they would be maybe highlighted in yellow. And the longer they're there, the closer it goes back to the, you know, the uh, white background. Just as so people have an idea of this is new, it may not be worth reliable, or um, uh, something like that. Uh, just might help alleviate their concerns. You know. Uh, I don't know where this one is going. I haven't heard about it in years. Yes. 
Who first? Oh, all right. Um, well, so also about the question you were asking about can we all just get along, uh, you know, and within, within big projects too. I mean, you obviously have like the core values of Wikipedia quite um, readily at hand when you're talking about it, and you also have a lot of history and stuff like that. And I think when the project grows in size, some people might be losing sight of what those core values are. And so one of the things with the Mozilla that we were doing was a workshop that helped people get gain awareness of the several layers within themselves and the ones that are the furthest from the project, like specific things about me as an individual that I don't expect you all to have in common with me to be in the same room together, but then when you come down like a few more layers in, there's the stuff you specifically do for the project, so maybe your articles, your area, your bubble, or whatever, and then below that there should be this core that you guarantee everyone in the room has, or this isn't the project for you, mm -hmm. right? And that, that's a very small thing, it's kind of like that one line policy, that's how small it should be. It should be like four or five words. We all believe in openness, we all believe in collaboration, we all, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then from that, in the terms of getting along, it's like, we may not be the same person, we may not uh, edit in the same place, and we may not have very many unique things about ourselves that match up, but we can get along because I can see that seed in you that is the same as it is in me, where we believe on just that level. Mm -hmm. And so I can see how what you do is reflective of that, just like what I do is reflective of that, it's just they go in different directions from that core. Mm -hmm. That's really useful. Yes. So I agree 100%, or 1,000%. Um, and a few questions to build on that. A, um, what is Wikipedia so afraid of? Is being 100% accurate all the time, instantly, one of those values? I think it is. Or is there something more core? Right. Um, and I think it's a perfect example of you know the expression that we have, you know, letting perfect get in the way of good. Um, and don't, if, when you lose sight of those core values and obsess or separate over the periphery, um, that stuff gets pushed, pushed aside and you get, you know, annoyances or worse. Mm -hmm. so, sure yeah, there's a couple of thoughts I have based on what's been bouncing around. One, uh, going back to what you said originally though, uh, I'm thinking again about that list of 30 or whatever it was articles uh, in the queue for deletion, and just bouncing off what you said, um, those articles had been in that state for, I don't know, four years or so. You yes. And so the urgency of getting them deleted now seems not super high, and it was part of your concern. And so I wonder, um, so now I'm going to say something which suggests increasing bureaucracy, which is why you should probably throw away my suggestion. But um, hypothetically, the, the articles for deletion process should state that the deletion process for an article will last as long as 25% of the duration the article is in there. <laughs> you mean the statute of limitations? Like, no, 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 no. Don't quickly erase things that have been sitting there in a certain state for a long time. Right, and not the statute of limitations, I'm saying that the mandatory, mandatory waiting, waiting period. <laughs> the, no, exactly. exactly. It's more like a mandatory waiting period. Is that, and at that point, if this article is going to be in a articles for deletion phase for a year, that's not an articles for deletion phase. That's a request for improvements phase. Mm -hmm. And that you phrase it in a way that I think everybody would like it to be. And at the end of that, it'll get reviewed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I actually do have possibly a constructive. <laughs> um, and that is that uh, it seems that um, editing in Wikipedia, from what I haven't seen the back backstage at all, but, uh, but it seems from what you're saying that it's all about what should be taken out, what's wrong, and that sort of thing. But uh, if you could add in, in the backstage space something where people, where editors are able to say, hey, great, this is really a good thing, uh, you know, and, and vote up part, parts of an article. That, that could be something that could bring back to the Any other points? Well, just yeah. based on like, the software release stuff that she was doing, because like, that's an area I'm interested in, uh, it almost seems like instead of this idea of deletion, you could, you could just sort of unpublish quietly an article after a period of time that hasn't yet met the requirements. So that, I mean, unless there's a concern for actual space somewhere, but hopefully that's taken care of. I mean, I just don't understand the motivation for deletion instead of perhaps like, until this meets a certain bar of satisfactory criteria, thing, it's going to be put in a beta state. One thing that I've noticed here was, um, and it happens with, I don't know, regular frequency. Um, people tend to use the deletion process as a way to induce improvement. Mm -hmm. um, because everybody's afraid of something being deleted. So they use it as a way to induce improvement in articles, even though that's not the point of the process. The, the, the thing here is it's hit or miss. It's, it works, but it's not the intention of the process. 
if you really wanted to do, if you really wanted to improve upon it, you could either ask for cleanup, or you would um, you do the work yourself. And it sounds like you end up keeping people who will edit out of fear and losing people and their articles if they won't put it in. Exactly. Yeah. So, if there, okay. It might be time, so maybe we could run the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.